How are y'all doing tonight? Just to give you a little bit of background about myself, I'm actually a member as well. Uh, have been since about 2008. Uh, pretty active within the past two years or so. Um, and, and, you know, David made me think about about a year ago, um, I, I had an opportunity to work with the Red Cross on a project uh, through my company helping them on some technology issues because, as he indicated, they run an extremely lean shop. And uh, what we were able to give them was mostly guidance on, on how to tackle some of their security challenges because one of their big challenges as a company uh, or as a disaster organization is when they show up on site in Katrina, as an example, or Sandy, you know, more recent, um, how do you electronically get information to all of the people that are looking for assistance? And that's actually my bailiwick, which is identity and access management. Uh, that's the role that I perform at Merck. But that's not what I'm going to be th talking to you about tonight. Uh, I'm going to be talking to you about, let me get this working, uh, social engineering. Uh, and it, it, not in the, the traditional sense, but um, it's, uh, you know, the subtitle as it came out in, uh, in the email was, uh, you know, social engineering or how I stopped, uh, wor learn to stop worrying and start thinking about security on the Internet. And I have little doubt that for some of you in the audience tonight, uh, some of this may be old hat. Uh, or, you know, hopefully there'll be a couple of things where you're like, wow, I didn't know that. Um, but the goal of the presentation is to accomplish two things. The first is hopefully to educate those um, or everyone, hopefully, uh, personally about security, but also as IT professionals, there's a good chance you get a phone call every once in a while, sometimes a lot, from somebody who needs help with something. My browser's not working because I installed some malware. Uh, I've been hacked. Um, something as subtle as just getting a network uh, router to work. We've all been there. Um, I have about five people on my street that I support on a pretty regular basis. Um, and I suspect you guys do the same. So um, the goal of this presentation is to be interactive. So if I come across stuff that you have questions on, by all means, raise your hand. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry? To help you educate your friends. Because that's one of the things that we, and I, I've heard Dave talk about this on a couple of occasions one of our roles as IT professionals oftentimes, and it's an indirect role, so it's probably not one that we always appreciate, is with the age of the Internet, especially with the boom in the last five years, people come to me with questions all the time. And I love to answer them because I love my job. Um, so one of the things that you know, I'm trying to do as an employee at Merck, which is the company that I work at, um, is to help get information security kind of into the DNA of the user as they're touching the web browser for the first time or they're touching their mobile device. Thinking about things of, if I get an email from a friend and it's a link that I don't recognize, is that something I want to click on? <laughs> That's the correct answer. Uh, or at least try and find out what it is. And it gets even harder nowadays with the, the URL shorteners that they have out there. It's some you know, cryptic mess that you're like, I have no idea where this goes. So. First, a little housekeeping. Uh, I am required by my company to tell you that these opinions are my own and not those of my employer. And the second one is, is I'm not offering any warranty based on the advice that I give you. In other words, if you do some of these things and you break something or worse, you get hacked, and that's one of the things I will talk about, that, that'll happen um, to anybody. Um, you know, don't blame me. <laughs> so. The timing of this was pretty good because I actually got this last week from the, or I guess two weeks ago from the Observer. Uh, identity thieves are preying on charlatans on social media. And the story is very, very simple, but what, it's surprisingly low tech. They're finding one of your friends on Facebook. They friend them, and then they might send you a friend request, or they might just send you a message. And they'll say, I work with Bank of America, or maybe I work with a more obscure bank. Um, there's some problems with your account, um, I'm here to assist you. Now, a lot of people, that might raise red flags, and you're like, no way am I talking to this guy. But not everybody is as savvy with, with these type of attacks. And so they'll arrange a meeting, and, or they'll simply say, if you can give me your bank account information, 
We'll make, exactly, yeah. If, if the sentence starts with, if you can give me your account information, uh, unless you know you're talking to the bank, um, and actually that'll be in the next uh, story, uh, there's a good chance there's something afoot. But unfortunately, some less than scrutinous people um, were, were subject to these attacks and you know, lost some money as a result of it. And uh, clearly it's a, you know, an issue not just worldwide, but in Charlotte. The one thing I thought was funny about this was the first comment that I saw on the post. Dorothy responded, I'm startled that anyone can earn $6,800 in four weeks on the computer at this URL. How many people would click on that URL? What I, and you guys may not get this joke, but when I read that message, all I could hear was that uh, guy Peggy from the uh, Discover Card commercials. So. Here's another story, and this one's actually based out of the UK, but again, the thing I want to emphasize is this is a low-tech attack. A lot of people think about social engineering as ha and hackers as being these really advanced people you know, doing things that we just simply can't detect, and that's not the case. And, and this was actually a pretty clever uh, attack. Uh, this gentleman in the UK went to his ATM, normal transaction, popped his card in, got some money out, went back to his apartment. He didn't see the guys that were you know, a few meters away watching what he was doing, uh, and followed him home. And so they immediately had at least one piece of information, his address. Using that information, they got his phone number. They called him the following morning and said, good morning, Mr. Welch. This is Visa Card Services. We show you've been overdrawn by $1,600. You know, that naturally causes a panic attack. Oh, my gosh, I've been hacked. The reality was he hadn't been hacked yet. But we're so trusting because all of a sudden the fear and the trust of somebody of an authority, the appeal to authority happens, and they arrange an exchange. Now, that set off alarms as well, but a car came by to pick up his card and issued him another card. Gave him another card and gave him a telephone number that he could call if he had questions. Guess where that telephone number didn't go? The bank. So eventually he did get a little bit wise because things didn't resolve over time. He called the actual bank number and they're like, uh, we're not showing any of those activities. We didn't issue you a new card. We do have a lot of charges on your account, however, and we do need to talk about those. So that's just another example of this involved no hacking whatsoever. This was guys following a guy from an ATM, looking up information online, and then executing effectively a con. And, and that's ultimately what social engineering is today. It's a digital version of the con. So what's the point here? As I've already said, none of these attacks involved what, you know, this is elite speak, that's as far as I get, as far as being able to spell that stuff, but this doesn't involve any elite hackers. Um, technology was the lowest common denominator in both of those types of attacks. Ultimately, social engineering is about three things, and it will vary based on the type of attack, technology, process, and people. And, and you'll hear that as kind of a, a recurring theme. The agenda is, you know, this is kind of loose, but I'll, I'll kind of introduce what social engineering is. I'm going to take you through a story of a gentleman by the name of Matt Honan, who is a senior editor at Wired Magazine. Some of you guys may have heard of him. We're going to kind of break down what happened in his hack because it's a great forensic story of, how technology can be used. Uh, we'll talk through the impacts of that, some of the things that could have been done to um, prevent it, and then we're going to take a break, uh, and that will depend on time, but um, uh, not the break, but where we break in the, the slide deck. And then um, I'll do a brief demo on setting up uh, two-factor authentication with Google and with a password manager known as LastPass. And I'll talk a little bit both about both of those. Hopefully most people know what Gmail is, but LastPass isn't as well known. And then, uh, then we'll conclude. So, Social engineering. I looked for a dictionary definition, and this made me giggle, but I, I included it anyway. The application of sociological principles to, to specific social problems. Uh -huh. Doesn't tell you much. However, the second definition is from a gentleman by the name of Chris Hadnagy, um, who has written several texts on the subject, and it's a better definition. It's the act of manipulating a person to take an action that may or may not be in their best interest. And I like the emphasis there, because social engineering isn't always about doing evil things. 
It's the means justify the ends concept. So they might send you to a site that gets you to donate money to a good cause. You know, how they got there might be a little unscrupulous, but that's ultimately the point. This little picture just you know, represents a low-tech hack or a low-tech con, the, the, the simple distraction scheme. So who are social engineers? And I like this diagram a lot because they're not always the people that you think they are. You know, everybody thinks of the guy, you know, sitting in his mother's basement, you know, preying on people when in reality it can be doctors and psychologists, disgruntled employees. How many stories have you heard about that? And obviously, well, yeah, okay, that's fair enough. So the point being, and you see the black hat and the white hat. The white hat typically does not have the intent to cause damage. They're simply there to notify people of, you know, hey, you might want to pay attention to this because you're exposed. Things of that nature. So why would somebody social engineer? And we've talked about this a little bit, but let's talk about the, the most obvious one, financial gain. I want to get access to a database of credit card numbers so I can start writing up debits on your account. Self-interest, you know, let's be honest. Uh, there was actually a very recent article, and I cannot remember the source from it, but it was uh, a journalist who was also a parent who chronicled his experience monitoring his children and some of the social engineering tools that he would use to monitor their activity on the, while they're online. And it, it's stirred up quite the discussion about it because there's some ethical questions obviously going on there. Um, so that's a good example of the self-interest. And then, you know, revenge. You know, uh, anonymous is probably the one that comes to mind where, you know, a country like us will do something that somebody doesn't like and then anonymous will attack websites associated with it. And when I say attack, attack in a very general term, but a lot of it involves social engineering, and I'll talk to that a little bit later. And then finally, you know, especially for the younger generation, they just see it as a challenge. Can I get in? Um, a really great speaker on social engineering, uh, a gentleman by the name of Jason Street, he's based out of Oklahoma City, uh, presented at the Charlotte ISSA conference this year. Was anybody there by any chance? Great presentation, because this guy was just the master of the low-tech hack. He could walk into a Bank of America branch, and he would be paid by Bank of America to do this. So that gets you the white hat concept. He gets paid by Bank of America to walk into their branch, and he'll walk out with two computers. He's not an employee, he didn't have an employee badge, but just by getting people's trust, he was able to walk off with company assets. Social engineering are involved in almost all hacks, but not necessarily all. Um, and the awareness is, is critical. And, and the point of this diagram here is to talk about through, you see how much money companies spend relative on what I'll call hardening your software systems, installing malware, firewalls, intrusion detection, intrusion prevention, all that stuff to lock down your access to a local network. That's how much they spend on what we call the human operating system. How many of you work at a company that have an active information security awareness program? Yep. And that's, that's part of the challenge. Um, you know, it, it's, it just doesn't get the priority that uh, the sexy stuff does. Some examples of social engineering. Um, you know, some of these are sexier than others. You know, this is the classic one of, you know, either, and when I say perimeter penetration, I'm not meaning just like getting in through your firewall. I mean getting through your physical security as well. Uh, dumpster diving, where you find a lot of information that maybe you weren't smart enough to shred. Uh, shoulder surfing. Uh, that was one of the things that Jason Street talked through where he was simply, you know, standing over someone's shoulder while they're typing in their password. Or even worse, they have it posted on a post-it note on their monitor. Phishing, obviously, and I'll be talking to that a little bit. Sophisticated ruses like the, the duck with the baby ducks. Uh, and insider attacks. Insider attacks, I do want to stress because that's where a lot of these attacks can come from. Talk a little bit about your identity because this is ultimately the root, uh, and this, is, this list is by no means exhaustive, but it just, it, the chart's kind of designed to get you thinking in terms of, as an entity on the internet, what factors or what attributes are considered important? 
obviously your social security number and date of birth, those are like the holy grail. If I get those two bits of information, I can pretty much create anything I want on your behalf. Um, not that I would, I'm a good guy. And so um, I do want to talk briefly about this. This is just a, kind of an introduction of some of the tools that are out there. Uh, if you do want to learn more about social engineering, these are some of the ones that you can take a look at. Probably the most popular one is SET, known as the Social Engineering Toolkit. Um, and, you know, again, these are technology tools that can be used to learn how to be a social engineer. It's not necessarily for evil. If you know what the bad guys are doing, you can also know how to stop them. And this is the social engineering cycle. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to go over this in any kind of detail, but just to give you an idea, you know, this phase is where you spend most of your time. Then once you have the information, you start exploiting that information, and then you execute your attacks. And that's, that's, you know, pretty much part and parcel of any attack cycle. So now we'll talk about Matt Honan. Um, there was an article in Wired back in, I think it was August of last year, uh, where Matt Honan, who is a senior writer for Wired Magazine, uh, was hacked. And, and he documented everything that happened related to that hack. Um, the attacker was phobia, but uh, it's a little deceptive because it makes you think it's a single hacker. But it, was, it, it, in fact, involved two people. And curiously enough, their objective was really to only get Matt's Twitter handle. Uh, his Twitter handle, for those who use Twitter, is just at Matt, M-A-T. So I guess if at Lance were a high target, you know, not that I would hack my way to, to get it, but I, I get kind of why it has an appeal. It has a social appeal to it. Um, and the collateral damage of what they did in the hack, uh, they compromised his Amazon account, all of his uh, data on Apple, and he was a big Apple fanboy. Um, and I am a little bit as well, so uh, I can say that uh, without being in glass houses. Uh, they compromised his iCloud and email account, his Gmail account, and his Twitter. Luckily, it stopped there, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that in a second. So how, how did this happen? We're going to kind of walk through the forensics of this. Um, and, th and this is exactly how the hackers went through it. Am I blocking anybody as far as being able to see this? Um, and a lot of this, is, all of this is public information with the exception of the phone conversations. His Twitter account was linked to a personal blog. They went to the blog, they got his email address. They said, okay, we, we need to hack into his email address so that we can capture his Twitter account. Well, two-factor authentication was not employed, and I'll talk about that more in a little bit. Um, every Gmail account that gets created, they ask for an alternate email address so that if you, for example, forget your password, they can email you a link to reset your password. They found that it was at me.com, mobileme.com. The service actually doesn't exist anymore. But um, that was basically the focus of their attack. So they go through the recovery steps to say, okay, I need to get access to this account first. Well, Apple wants two pieces of info. They want your billing address. Well, if I know who Matt Honan is, there's a good chance I could probably find out what his billing address is. And then they want last four digits of a, of a credit card. Every retail establishment you go to and you use a credit card, what's on that receipt? That's why you always take your receipts. That little bit of information is key to a number of retailers, and we'll talk through that a little bit more in a second. So here we go into the second stage. The objective to get access to the Apple account, we've already talked about. First assumption, and it was probably a pretty good one, Matt probably has an Amazon account. In order to get an Amazon reset on your password, you have to give them the last four digits of your credit card or a credit card on the account. So they call Amazon's support. So now we're into the human chain uh, of the hack. And they want to know the name on the account, which they have, the email address, it's either the me.com or the gmail.com address, most likely, easy to guess, and the billing address. That was all it took to add the credit card, because what they did was they added either theirs or a fake credit card to the account. They hang up, they wait a little bit, they call Amazon again and they say, I need to get my password reset, but I can't do it online. Okay, well what's the last four digits of a credit card that's on your account? Now, the failure in this process was here. And I'll talk to this in a second. But you notice they didn't ask him for any of the credit card information on the first phase of the call. It wasn't by design. Somebody didn't do their job. And that talks again about the human failings of security. You might have a process that works. And when it's executed, it does work. 
but everybody doesn't follow the process. And Amazon wasn't the only one that was guilty of this. So, Phobia then calls Apple, now that he has the information he needs, because he has the last four digits, because he just got into the guy's Amazon account. Uh, he has the last four digits of the uh, credit card, and now he hacks the uh, mobile me account. That allows him to get access to the iCloud account. And now that he has access to this, he can go back to Gmail and compromise that account, which is what he wanted in the first place so that he can reset the Twitter password. So what happened? They got into the Twitter account. They locked him out of his Gmail account, his Amazon account, his Apple email, his Apple ID account, and Twitter. And that's just the account hacks. Here's where the real damage hit. Matt had Find My Mac feature or Find My Device feature enabled on his MacBook, his iPad, and his iPhone. One of the features of that service, if you were to lose your iPhone, is I could log on to my account very quickly and remote wipe my device. It's actually gotten slightly better, and I'll talk through that in a second. The real critical part of this was um, on his MacBook, which he had not backed up recently, he had just had a new baby daughter, his first, and had a year of photos on it. And he lost those photos. The good news is he got those photos back eventually with, with the help of some very good um, forensics recovery people. But this hack could have been worse. I mean, in reality, he lost some photos, which, don't get me wrong, are precious, and he got locked out of his accounts for a little bit. He was able to recover all of those accounts by contacting them directly and working through that. It's a hassle. But the damage was pretty limited, but it could have been a lot worse. They could have compromised his LinkedIn account, which some people might go, oh, no big deal. Uh, Facebook, but more importantly, his online banking accounts, any work-related accounts. There's a good chance working at Wired, he probably uses Dropbox. Could have gotten into that. As far as financial damage, he could have ordered a lot of nice stuff from Amazon. Um, you know, any retirement accounts that he may have had, they may have been able to get to, into. and his, one of the interesting things about the story was Matt was actually able to talk to the hackers that did this to him. And, you know, part of the article, if you haven't had a chance to read it, all you need to do is, is Google Matt Hone and Wired Hack, and, and you'll get the article. Um, they were going after his email contacts next. And that was particularly important for him because being a senior writer at Wired Magazine, he talks to a lot of CEOs and C-level executives and they would have been the next object of the phishing attack. Hi, I'm Matt Honan. How are you doing? You know, get more information, get more hacks. But backing up just a second, one of the reasons why I highlight this is it wasn't just his email contacts that are serious. They get your contacts as well. And then they wind up attacking your friends as you, which probably doesn't get you in their best favor. But more importantly, it's more people that can be attacked. So let's talk briefly about why it happened. And, and we've talked through some of this. The process of security support from these online providers, in this case particularly Apple and um, Amazon, uh, one of two things, either they had a bad process to begin with or the person on the phone didn't follow the process. And here's a, t a phone conversation that I'm sure you guys are familiar with. I call up Amazon.com. I don't really remember my credit card number. I just lost my wallet. Can you help me out here? Find the right sympathetic person. You'll get those numbers. Same thing with Apple. And Apple was even worse, in my opinion. Um, one of the problems with Find My Mac and, and the associated services was they did not employ two-factor authentication. That has actually recently changed, I think about four months ago. Um, I don't have that enabled on my devices for that very reason, but um, I did turn on the two-factor authentication. Um, the password recovery feature sometimes can be very poor. Uh, if you guys are familiar with some of the websites when you forget your password, you may have set up answers to arcane security questions that you have no idea what answer you put in. Or worse, they're very easy to guess. What's your favorite color? How long does it take me to get that answer? One of the things I would suggest in this, and I'll talk to it a little bit in the solutions, is when you're answering uh, security questions, come up with a system, and hopefully a very easy to remember system, that comes up with creative ways to answer those questions. Instead of what's your favorite color, I like to paint. I'm just throwing that out there as an example. 
but they're not going to guess I like to paint. They're going to guess red, blue, purple, magenta, you know, whatever, you know, that answer may be, even if you think it's a clever color, you know, uh, fuchsia. Um, you know, the last four digits, the, social, the uh, credit card number is just a poor standard, and it's a replacement of the social security standard. Nobody likes giving away their social security number either, even if it's the last four digits. That's still a critical piece of information. Um, both of these providers have made some changes to their process in response to the fact that Matt pretty much pants them on the internet. Um, but, but the bottom line is the industry, industry's approach is outdated and flawed, and the execution is flawed. If you work customer support and you're letting people through based on sympathy, you're compromising their account. Maybe not that time, but you're going to let somebody through, and that's what happened here. So the account holder shortcomings, what did Matt not do? Well, first of all, as I indicated, he didn't back up his data. I actually got the benefit. It, part of this presentation was part of a graduate project that I did, and I asked him to, if I could interview him for probably about 30 minutes. And he was kind enough to, to do so, so I'm interviewing a writer. Um, and you know, he said, he, obviously, he is doing it now. He's much more aggressive about his backups. That's one of the things. It's the easiest solution to any of these problems, and it's something you can, everybody can do. Disk space is cheap these days. You can go out and get a, a terabyte drive to back up most of your critical information or back it up online, and I'll talk to that in a second, uh, very easily. Two-factor authentication wasn't activated for any of these. Now, some of the accounts didn't allow it, but some of them did. The other problem is, is that the accounts were linked or daisy-chained, and, and what I mean by that is all roads led back to his mobile being account. Um, he had the same account ID for his Apple email when I cloud, and a lot of people are guilty of that, and I'll be honest, so am I. Because um, it's stuff you want to remember. But as a practice, you might want to come up with hybrids of it so that people aren't guessing what it is. My wife actually does a good job with that, surprisingly, and she's not a tech person. But um, He also used the same credit card for different accounts. That's a, you know, and, that, and that's a common thing. You know, for some people, if you only have one credit card, what else are you going to use? Some banks nowadays will uh, allow you to issue temporary credit cards. So I know it's kind of a pain because you don't want them storing the temporary credit card because it's limited use. But like if you're doing your Christmas shopping and you know you're going to go spend $500 on Amazon, go to your bank, get a temporary card, use it once, and then you're done. That way that information is not compromised. Uh, the password recovery options were a little too simple. And uh, this is a tough one to, to conquer. Personal information was accessible easily online. Bottom line is you can Google me. I show up number two in the search results. If you want to find out where I lived in the past 28 years, you're going to be able to find where I've lived in the past 28 years. So finding out that information isn't that hard. The other thing I encourage everybody to do, Google yourself. What can you find out about yourself? You know, um, and it's also a way to research other people, like potential employees, just saying. Um, so. I'm going to pause here for a second just because I've been kind of opening the fire hose here. Any questions so far? How, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Oh, man, I wish. Um, you raise a great point. Did everybody hear the question? Um, and Spokio is a really good example where you can get a lot of information about somebody for free. Um, and Spokio, and the problem is, is it varies by vendor. It's not like a do not call registry where I just put in my phone number and boom, I'm done. Um, but you know, sites like Spokio uh, is not a bad idea to visit them, find out how you can get them to pull your information off of the publicly searchable listings. Um, and you can do that for a variety of sites. If you're showing up in search engines, you know, for a particular site, maybe especially for a site that you're not even using anymore. Because one of the, the other thing you'll discover if you haven't Googled yourself before, there's a lot of accounts that you signed up for a long time ago that you may not even know exist. So it might be a good idea to go and cancel those accounts. I'm sorry. Uh, S P O K E O. I guarantee you, if you Google your name. Especially if you Google your 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 full name, you know, because if your name's Mike Smith, obviously <laughs> you might not show up in the. Uh, you know, I have the benefit of a, a relatively rare name, um, 
So it, it, it's not as hard, but it can be a challenge. Uh, in general, I would say no. Um, but a bad website can be accessed from a, web, from a phone and from a computer. So it, it's not a real simple answer to that question. In terms of the number of vulnerabilities, um, I don't have data on the Windows 8 platform yet uh, in terms of malware. But I know generally there's a lot more malware for Android than there is for Apple um, in terms of the mobile platforms that are out there. Um, so you can speak to the vulnerabilities in that way. Um, the number one thing I would recommend you do, and I know it's a pain, password protect your phone. Because one of the tools I'm going to tell you about has a great mobile app feature so that you can access your passwords no matter where you are. So if you go up to your sister's up in Connecticut and you need to log on to your bank account, you want to create a nice password that's not easy to remember, you can put it on your mobile device. But if your mobile device can be opened with a swipe, it's not real secure. Um, so there's not a real simple answer to that. Yes, sir. That's a great point. And, and, and the other excuse that Spokio has, and unfortunately it's valid, is like if I know you're a Charlotte resident and I know your full name, you own a house, I can probably find out where you live. Not even using Spokio, just using their GIS system. Yeah, you know. So, you know, there are some challenges with that. It's, it's one of those things where you have to look at the effort versus the reward. The less of a profile you have, the better. Unless, of course, you're, like, trying to make a living at doing this. And, you know, I'm not. You mean, like, key loggers? Oh, very easy. <laughs> Just Google key loggers. Um, and, and, yeah, that was it's an interesting question because that was one of the things that the, the parent I mentioned did. And, and it's not uncommon. I mean, you know, I'll be honest. I'm glad I'm not a kid in this age. Um, frankly, I'm not sure I would have graduated college if I was uh, because there's just so many more distractions. But, uh, you know, it, the, the, that's how you can find the software. And they're very easy to find. The key loggers you don't want to find are the malware ones that are hiding in the background that you don't have any control over. You know, so that's why you want, to, you want to control what happens on your computer as much as possible. Sometimes you can't. I've gotten hacked. I wound up losing my Windows 7 PC for three days because this software, I have no clue what I clicked that installed it. But somehow, you know, it was what they call a hijacking attack where um, they literally hold your computer hostage. Because uh, they'll tell you that you have a virus, and they're right. It's their virus. Um, but uh, the only way to get rid of that virus, even though it's not going to get rid of it, is to buy their software. They call it ransomware. Um, yes, and that was ultimately what I used to, to cure it. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's a great point. <laughs> it, that, and that's the worst part of it. Love your T-shirt, by the way. <laughs> that's a great idea. That's a great point. <laughs> oh, yeah. And 
I'm sure it's worse now. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm wrapping up my, my uh, master's degree at UNCC, and I mean, the level of hackery that goes on there is, you know, legend. Um, but there's also a, a good uh, white hat hacking group called um, the 49th uh, Division. Um, and I've got a couple of friends that are in that group, and it's a great training ground if you're looking for, you know, if you are going to college at UNCC, um, it's a great training ground to learn information security, you know, literally by doing it. So, yes, sir. Um, Rather than commenting on a specific product, because um, I, I don't want to be seen as endorsing anything, uh, there are some great free products out there. Uh, and, and one of the challenges with vendors um, of their nature, it's not that you don't get a good product, um, I, I, but you can also get a good product for free is, is ultimately what I would say. Yes, sir. That, that's a great point because they have a vested interest because they don't want you turning the rest of their network into zombies. Yes. Yeah, there's a couple of reputable sites out there that you can look to for reviews, particularly of those products. Um, and if there's a product that you're looking for, like Norton Internet uh, Security Essentials, type that in Google and type reviews. And, and you know, look at hopefully some of the more reputable sites. Um, I, I'm a little old school. I still like PC Magazine's reviews. I, I think generally they're pretty fair. Um, but but there's also some other websites out there that can help you as well. Yes, sir. Well, in principle, I agree with that. Uh, what I'll say is look at where the site's going. If it's a Microsoft error message and it's taking you to a Microsoft site, that might have some useful information. If it's taking you to a, you know, a, an URL you've never heard of, especially if it has like a .ru extension on it, which means it's in Russia, um, you may not want to go there. Uh, not Googling, I would just say be, be wary of where you're going. Is ultimately because it's the awareness that's the difference maker. Yes, sir. Good point. Or go directly to their website. Absolutely. So some of you probably. I'm sorry. Were there any more questions? Or yes, sir. Microsoft Security Essentials? Uh, no, I run that all the time. Okay. Now. Yeah, they they rebranded it. Okay. This gentleman in the very back, and I'll, I'll get you in just a second. That's a great question, uh, and in my field, I have a little bit of an opinion on that. Biometrics have value, but they're a little dangerous. Um, and the example I'll give is um, thumbprints. If your thumbprint gets compromised, I haven't really found an employer yet that would pay for a thumb transplant. Um, 
and that's a little snarky and a little oversimplistic, but it, it's the idea behind, I, I think there's definitely a place for biometrics uh, in this equation because when you're talking about authentication, and authentication is proving who you are, there's three primary and there's arguably a fourth, but I'll, I'll talk to you the primaries. It's something you have, something you are, and something you know. And obviously biometrics is something you are. So if I'm doing a retinal scan, a fingerprint, um, I, I know several companies have started working with voice recognition technology where they can actually analyze your voice to an nth degree. And really all these are is mathematics. They're detecting patterns in your voice and they're plotting numbers based on it. Um, and, and there's some, some pretty promising research in that area. But I think that has a limited role. I know Apple is allegedly coming out with a mobile device that's going to, you know, they're going to have a thumbprint scanner on it. And I think that could be interesting. Um, I actually hope to blog about that a little bit when they release it because I think it's an interesting use case that might be more valuable than some other systems. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Microsoft Recovery Toolkit, I think is that the name of it? Yeah. These are all great suggestions, and, and you guys are clearly a lot more aware than, uh, than most pe people, which is great. <laughs> How many of you live uh, south of the border here? So you probably have a little bit of experience with a uh, little story uh, here, uh, and its recency, unfortunately, is quite painful. Uh, nearly all taxpayers in South Carolina had their information compromised uh, in a pretty massive, uh, what they call advanced persistent threat attack. And, uh, yes, sir. So those are some of the calls that you've gotten as a result of this? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and, and that's where the opportunity is because it's not just the guys that executed the hack. Social engineers who are like, woohoo, here's an opportunity. Let me find somebody who lives in Clover. I have their address. Let's see if I can get the credit card information. Yes, sir. <laughs> well, and the thing is, and Jason Street really stressed this at the ISSA conference, um, those attacks aren't designed to get people like us. They're designed to get that 10 to 20 percent, maybe that number is a little higher, of somebody who's going to be a little more trusting. Oh, my God, somebody just got my information. You're going to help me. So that fear and trust bridge automatically happens. Um, just talk, breaking down the hack real briefly, um, this whole thing started with one spear phishing attack. And I'm going to tell you what spear phishing is in a second. Um, they discovered it in, like I said, August of last year. Here's how they found out about it. And this is the part that the CIO of the South Carolina Department of Revenue or South Carolina in general, uh, I think may have lost his job over, if I'm not mistaken. Um, the Secret Service called them up because, of course, they're part of the Department of Treasury. And they notified them that, oh, by the way, we've discovered that you've been breached, and here's the details of the breach. That's the last way you want to find out you've been hacked. And unfortunately, that's the most common way people find out that they've been hacked, from an external source. So they hired a very reputable company to come in um, and, and do a complete forensic analysis of what happened. Uh, the department, uh, South Carolina, 
wisely pretty much signed everybody up or gave everybody the option of signing up for identity theft service. And I hope if you haven't signed up for it, you'll go home tonight and do so. Um, because bottom line is your information has been compromised and um, you need something that's actively monitoring what's taking place on your credit record. Generally, credit and bank providers will be pretty, they'll work with you, but only to a degree. And one of the comments that I have is, Phishing emails are getting a lot trickier. You know, when I talk about phishing, a lot of people think of like the Nigerian prince scam. Everybody got in that email. It's like, yeah, yeah, funny. I actually got one. The new one is the Syrian prince. Uh, he, he, not prince. He's a cousin of Bashar al-Assad. And, of course, they need to make uh, financial investments in alternative industries because they're having some financial problems right now. Um, so, you know, th those scams will come along. That's not what's getting people. Anybody here play World of Warcraft? Come on, nobody? Nobody that'll admit to it, right? I'll admit to it. This was an email I got a couple of years ago. And, uh, you know, it's got all of the stuff that looks like it's an official email from Blizzard. And you'll see this link right here, play free now. Here's what happens if I click on that link. I would expect to go to battle.net. Where I really go is this guy. And I guarantee you, you log in there, your account's going to get hacked. Now, the good news is even Blizzard now has two-factor authentication. And it's for a gaming account. But hacking had become so commonplace. And Blizzard has something like 38 million subscribers to their, their game. I'm no longer an active subscriber. But that number is just staggering. But it's a fertile ground for hacking. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Yep. Absolutely. And what they're asking you to do is what's called multi-factor or two-factor authentication. Your password is something you know. It's only one factor. It's only one secret. But if you have what they call two-factor authentication, and, and what that gentleman was talking about is he's required to pull up a secret code each time he logs in. And that way, if some guy in Russia is trying to steal his account, unless he has access to the device that generates that secret code, and oftentimes it's something like this, if he doesn't have access to that, he can't get your account. Now, I don't want you to think that two-factor authentication is like bulletproof. It has its own issues, but it helps you tremendously. So if you have vendors that support it, and I'll talk to this in a little bit in a second, I highly recommend you take advantage of it. And if somebody has critical information of yours and they're not using it, ask them to get it, because that's the only way they're, they're, they're going to do it. It'll either happen that way or they'll get hacked. And then they're like, yeah, we're thinking about stepping up our security measures now. Like uh, LinkedIn, I don't know if you heard. Is everybody here on LinkedIn, I hope? <laughs> Uh, if you're looking for a job, you should be, because that, that's where the new job board is. Um, LinkedIn got hacked, and the terrible thing that LinkedIn did, and I can't believe they, they did this, um, they did hash their passwords, and a hash is nothing more than just encrypting your password one way, but they didn't salt their passwords. And in security terms, if you're not familiar with salt, what salt is is it's a random number that they put at either the front or the back of your password before they hash it so that if somebody gets access to what's encrypted, they'll never guess your password. Because if they do manage to, even though it's mathematically infeasible to do so, but if they do manage to decrypt that password, what they're decrypting is the password plus the salt. So they would never be able to log in with that information. Yes, sir.
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Depends on who's looking. <laughs> I said it depends on who's looking. It's good to know. How would you rate his technical level of the podcast? Could somebody who wasn't security oriented um, understand them? Just depends on the subject matter. Okay, that's good to know. GRC.com. Yeah, there's another gentleman that I follow by the name of Bruce Schneier, uh, some of you may have heard of. Um, CNN, I, I think it was CNN, actually smartly just pulled him on board with the whole NSA surveillance stuff. He, he's, uh, you know, a uh, pretty leading uh, uh, thought leader on, on security and, and has some good opinions on that. And that <laughs> sure. <laughs> you have to pay to find out. <laughs> I know. I, I get the same thing. It's like, really? Okay. Um, so I'm going to briefly go through this because a lot of these lessons I've already talked through. But just one of the things I am going to do is make this presentation available online. Um, and, and I'll give uh, Dave the info on, on how to get that. It'll just pull it off my website or I'll put it up on SlideShare. Basic. <laughs> Actually, it won't because I have a Creative Commons license on it. So. Um, how, do, how do you prevent this? You adopt a proactive password strategy. The first rule, and I guarantee you every person in this room, even those who would shake their head and say no, never reuse your passwords. And I guarantee you everybody does it, including myself. What I'll do is on some of the sites, I have a common password that I use, but I know it's information that's thrown away. Um, and even I shouldn't be doing it, frankly. It's just lazy. Develop a password system. And obviously you want to develop one that makes sense to you. But some of the things you can think through is come up with an anagram of your favorite sports teams. And then use that as like a salt for your own passwords. Um, you know, the, the, and if you Google online, and I, I know I'm telling you guys to Google all the time, there, there's numerous password systems out there you can come out with. What I like to do is come up with something that's meaningful to me. And it drives my wife nuts because when I'm actually telling her my password, she's like, that's so cryptic, but it makes perfect sense if I explain exactly what each of the digits mean. Um, the other option is, um, and, and I do include this as an or, if you use a password manager, um, they can come up with really nice complex passwords that you don't have to remember. And I'm going to do a little bit of a demo after the break of how to use LastPass. Um, it's a free product online. Uh, they do have a premium version if you want to use it on mobile devices, and, and I love it. It's a dollar a month, you know, so it's not terribly expensive, uh, and it's a good company. Um, but like I already mentioned, use two-factor authentication whenever you can. Um, some of these we've already talked about. Backup. Um, you can do some of your backup online. Obviously, you want to look at your providers if they're doing online backups because <laughs> you want to make sure they're secure because you're only as secure as they're practicing security for your data. Uh, offline is an option too. You know, like I said, you can go to Best Buy today and, and get you know, a terabyte hard drive uh, for 50 bucks. That may even be less than that by now. Uh, the other thing, and a lot of people don't do this, is, oh, I back up my data all the time. Have you actually tried to restore it? You might find out that that hard disk has gotten corrupted. So when you find out at the worst possible time that that data isn't available, that's a really bad time to find that out. So your backup is only as good as your recoverability. And then finally, watch what you click. And I know it sounds basic, but th this is the th piece that I have to preach to a lot of my friends. Because if they get an email from me, well, it's Lance. I can trust him. Well, if Lance got hacked, it may not be as trustful. And it's a pretty simple rule. If you don't know it or trust it, don't click it even from friends. Or what I will sometimes do, because every once in a while one of my friends will get hacked on Facebook and I'll get this, 
hey, I found a really great vegan solution for something who, from somebody who I know isn't a vegan. Um, and I'll just send them a note back. Is, did you send this? Or I'll come up with a secret that I know only he knows. It's just something like, you know, what bar did we meet at two weeks ago? You know, just to authenticate the guy based on something he knows. But th that's just an example of if you get it from somebody who regularly sends you stuff that, you know, might be trustworthy but you're just not sure, send them a reply back and ask them a question. Hey, how's it going? How's your leg feeling? And they might reply, well, it wasn't my leg, it was my arm. And you're like, good, it's you. <laughs> so. And I think, is this the good time for a break? Okay, great. We'll take a, was it 10, 15 minute break? <laughs> Eat the ice cream is the word for management. <laughs> What I plan on doing is um, a relatively brief demo, um, not with as many services as I had hoped, but uh, to be honest, with the two that I'm going to do, you're going to get the gist of it. Um, and, and all of these providers have um, pretty good uh, instructions on, on how to set these things up. So I'm going to talk through a couple of things first, and then I'll get into the demo. Uh, I'm going to be doing the demo with Google Authenticator. Uh, first thing to note about Google Authenticator, and this slide comes out weird for some reason. I, I haven't figured out why the transitions aren't working. First to note is that it's free. A friend of mine reminded me that it's not technically free because it does require that you have a smartphone, so <laughs> uh, which it was a very fair point. Um, the best part is it can run on multiple devices. Uh, I think it runs on nearly all platforms with the exception maybe of Windows 8. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, Windows Phone, I'm, I'm not positive. Um, one of the nice things about it uh, with respect to the, your Gmail account, um, or your Google account, I should say, uh, it will force another nice security feature r relative to your mobile devices, and that's called application-specific passwords. And what it will allow you to do, and I'm not going to demo this particular piece of it, but um, once you've enabled two-factor authentication on it, obviously that doesn't work if you have an iPhone or Android device where it's a native application. It's not going to prompt you every time you know, for what that one-time pin. Some of the apps will, but most of them will not. What they've done to get around that is, is they will get you to create a one-time password, and they're very long. They're, I, I think they're about 30, 32 characters. Um, but you only have to type it in on your mobile device once, so it's not that bad. But the upside of it is, if your mobile device is compromised, they can't get your password to that account, which is kind of nice. Currently, and this list is not exhaustive, um, the apps that support Google Authenticator, uh, Google, obviously, uh, LastPass, Dropbox, WordPress, Amazon Web Services, uh, even CentOS, it's a, a distribution of Linux, will support Google Authenticator, which I think is kind of clever. Uh, they have an open API, so you could technically, if, if you're a really uh, solid application developer, you can tie into their APIs and actually include it in your uh, authentication schema as well. Um, obviously, as I already mentioned, make sure that mobile device is secure or Google Authenticator doesn't get you much. And finally, uh, and I used to make fun of Microsoft on this, but they finally fixed it. Uh, I used to make, say, you know, what major mail provider doesn't support two-factor authentication, but the, uh, they added it a few months ago. Um, but the answer to this, in spite of the fact that their web services support two-factor authentication, Amazon does not. And most of the major retailers out there on the Internet don't support two-factor yet, uh, which is a little surprising. The two exceptions to it that I really like are eBay and PayPal which are the same company, so it's not surprising. Um, but, but they have a, a separate device. You can, for a very cheap price, I think it's like three bucks, you can get a fob, uh, a little device that will have a random password that generates every time you log in, um, which I really like. Or um, Symantec has a product that I believe is free to download. Um, I use it because my company uses the product and I'm able to pair it with it. But um, it's just another method, and if you do a lot of transactions through PayPal, <laughs> that's a good thing to have, because you could lose a lot of money through there very quickly, and the recovery time on that is not as fast as your bank would be, um, although eBay might contest that. It's not a product endorsement. So, and I, I'm going to go through this very briefly, because I'm actually going to walk through it uh, manually. But securing the, the Gmail accounts, basically you click on um, where your name is, you're going to go into settings. Um, and then we'll, you know, we'll walk through all the options in a second. 
This is really just for reference if you download the slides down the road. But these instructions are also available on the Internet. There's even YouTube videos that will walk you through it that are far better than what I'm giving you here. Um, I'm not going to do Yahoo, but Yahoo also has two-factor authentication. Uh, Facebook also has two-factor. Um, they use a one-time SMS pin um, every time you log in, and it's a session that you don't have. So for the gentleman who I can't see, Asked me about clearing his cookies for his Facebook login. If you do do this, it's going to send you a one-time pin every time you log into Facebook because it's tied to your cookie. Um, but it is nice to have because I know instantly whether somebody's using my Facebook account or not, you know, if it's on a browser that I haven't logged into. Uh, and actually, they wouldn't be able to get in because uh, the pin goes to my mobile device. So, and then securing LastPass, again, I'm going to go through this one as well. Uh, I'm a huge fan of LastPass. This is the one product endorsement I'll make, uh, besides obviously Google Authenticator. Uh, great product. The one thing that makes people nervous, and I totally get it, is LastPass is storing your passwords on the Internet. The big advantage is they encrypt the heck out of it. And they give you several security solutions, some of which I'll, I'll talk through, and, and then one of which I'll demo with the Google Authenticator. But they make it as secure as possible. So as long as you're a good practitioner of security, this is a great solution to keep complex passwords on your accounts, even can memorize additional details surrounding your account if you want to give yourself some tips and whatnot. Um, but it's, it's a great product. Um, and now I'm going to switch over to the demo here. So let's see if the right screen comes up. There we go. And I went to the wrong screen. Okay. My mouse will work. There we go. Oops. Well, hold on a sec. Let me fi fix this with mirroring. Okay, so this is just a standard Google login. But what I'm going to go to first, well, actually, I take that back. One of the nice features of LastPass is they also have a plug-in for all of the major browsers. So I click on that, and I can log in. If I have two-factor authentication enabled, the first time when I log in, it will ask me for my uh, password because I don't have it set up yet because I haven't done that. Um, I can type it in. And now you see the little red asterisk is active. It loads that information, and I can log in. And you can see I haven't used this account much. So we're now logged into Google, and now we're going to go over to LastPass. This is the LastPass's website. So we're, um, as you can see, I think we're already logged in. We haven't really done anything yet, but really the focus is on the security side. So you'll see through the security tabs, uh, you can do an awful lot with this product. One of the things I also like about it, besides the uh, two-factor authentication, you can restrict where you can receive logins from. So if somebody from Russia is trying to log into your LastPass account, they'll actually block the login attempt based on your account settings, which is nice. Uh, if you go abroad, you might want to fix that, but you know, that's a whole other issue. But as you can see, I can check this box, only a login allowed from the United States. That at least reduces you know, my hacker base by probably about 80%. Uh, and we'll go to the security tab here in a second. Yes. Won't go into a great detail about that, but Tor Network is a little bit of an underground network um, that you probably, unless you have a specific reason you want to be there, shouldn't go there. Um, this is uh, an area where you can set the security levels, uh, and it basically will just become more of a challenging app to use. Um, security is about balancing security and convenience. So, you know, this is kind of use of your own. Uh, I do not recommend grid multi-factor authentication. I'm not even going to describe what it is, so I'm not encouraging you. That's a pain in the butt to use. Um, it does support fingerprint readers, but you notice it said, ah, I don't have one. 
But if it did have a biometric, I can't remember the gentleman who asked about biometrics, but uh, it does support that. Um, and you can also choose when it's going to challenge you for your last pass password. If you want to be really onerous, every time it logs you into a site automatically, it could ask for that password. So that's the security tab. You can also set up a security email, which will give you all kinds of notifications when you're doing things. It can get a little chattery. <laughs> So either set up filters. If you want to keep that, it's a great feature because you know exactly what's going on with your account, but it can get a little chatty. And if you filter it and put it into a folder or something, it might be useful. But what we're going to focus on is um, the multi-factor options. And you'll see on here, um, they have two multi-factor options here. They technically have three. They also allow for a USB key uh, to be used. But they offer YubiKey. YubiKey will send you this little device. It's pretty inexpensive. Um, the only challenge with it is you do have to have premium subscription to LastPass in order to use it, which, again, it's a dollar a month. It's $12 a year. It pays for itself, in my opinion. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to use the Google Authenticator piece. Yes. Now, um, and this can't get much easier. <laughs> um, of course, I have to sign into my phone because I haven't been signed in in a while. Um, but literally, all I have to do, I don't know if this is going to work going against that screen. We'll see. Um, obviously, you can't see this on the, the screen, but this is the Google Authenticator app. You can see the four sets of numbers. That's four different applications in which it's got a one-time password that I have to use for a specific interval. What I'm going to do is I'm going to hit the plus button to add something and I'm going to scan the barcode, and I'm not positive if this is going to work. But, oh, it sure as heck did. How handy. And at the bottom, it says LastPass, uh, Inigo M87. Last time I did this demo, I did Ted Stryker, and I got blank stares when I referenced Ted Stryker. But I was dealing with a lot of college students, so I figure Inigo Montoya is a little more uh, mainstream. Um, but what it... Yeah. <laughs> um, and it added that password. Now, what it does is the next time I log in, I'm going to, and I may only have time for this one. Let's see. So we're now running the device, and I'm going to enter in, you have to enter in two sets of numbers. So the one thing with Google Authenticator you want to pay attention to, there's a little timer up in the left-hand corner. I know you guys can't see it from here. You're going to use this. Make sure it's not getting close to the end when you do it, because by the time you type it in and hit enter, you know what I mean. It'll time out before you actually get to use it, and it's actually about to do that. Um, so I'm going to let it cycle, because it'll go through a number every 30 seconds. I think, uh, 60 seconds, I think, is the interval. Um, and that's all it took to set it up. Now... I'm going to drop this window. And now I'm going to log out. I'm going to log back in. And what it should do. Oh. I think I canceled it. Yeah, it didn't take. Okay, so let's try. Yes, sir. Well, it's really, it's, it's an addition to it. It's not, you know, you're still going to enter in your Google account and your password. Um, the first time you log into the site, however, if it doesn't see a session cookie for you, it's going to go, this is the first time you've logged in on this browser. Give me your Google uh, Authenticator. Let me enter this real quick. Right. Is that something you what? Um, 
my personal opinion, I would have just wasted my time if I said no. <laughs> um, two reasons. It, it is, because it just texts you the number. It, it, um, Understandable. Um, the good news is the authenticator, uh, I don't think, has that uh, impact on you. Um, the other thing, I, really two reasons. I think it's a pretty elegant solution, given its extensibility, that I can have so many sites just in that one category. So I'm not, okay, I'm doing SMS on this provider. I'm doing Google Authenticator on this provider. I'm doing Semantic VIP on this provider. I like the fact that it's an open platform they can do it on. The second reason is uh, SMS is sus subject to man-in-the-middle attacks. Uh, there is a specific mobile malware out there. I can't remember the name of it. I just saw it today uh, again. Um, but basically where you go to a malicious site, it installs some malware on your mobile device, particularly on Android, but I think even iOS is subject to it, um, where they will screen scrape the number and post it back to your financial provider. And they'll wait until you log into your financial provider's website to actually execute the attack. Um, so, okay. Well, and that, I, I think what I would say to that is you can function securely on Android, it's just harder. Sure. I understood. I kind of figured based on your T-shirt. Right. And frankly, that is why I don't use Android devices. Um, I, I think a similar case could be made for for Blackberries, even iOS. You know, you're still at the mer you're more at the mercy of the software developer instead of the carrier, but you're still at their mercy. So I'm going to log in here real quick. And this time it should say, "There we go." And so, and the nice thing with this is you don't have to do this every time. You can set it to force it every time. But if you're on a trusted device, for example, I've got a fairly complex password to my user account on here. And this doesn't leave my site. So I might only say I only need that once. Um, but if you want to be more secure, you can by all means do that. And you'll see it let me into the vault based on the second factor of authentication. The vault, I have nothing in here currently, but that's where you can store all your sites and your passwords. The nice thing is it also includes the hyperlink, so if you want to use that as your form of bookmarks, as one gentleman mentioned, um, this is a very secure way of doing it because you know exactly where you're going, unless they compromise your DNS. But we won't go into that subject uh, because that's a whole other discussion. Now, I'm very briefly going to show the Google side of it because uh, we are running out of time. But all you need to do in order to go enable this on Google, and it is a two-step process, um, you click on your settings, and then you go to security. And as you can see, I've already set up my cell phone as the recovery options. And I have not turned on two-step verification. You have to turn on two-step verification, which does the SMS challenge that you were talking about, and then you can turn on Google Authenticator as an alternative. You can just leave the SMS piece on. And again, the nice feature about that is, is if this is a computer, like for example, that you use at home, uh, and it's a browser that only you use. Now, if your kids use it, I would definitely turn the security on. Um, but if it's something only you use, you only have to do this once. Or maybe force it to remind you every so often. But you would set up the two-step verification. It would send a SMS text to my phone. Um, I would then key in the, the code that it gives me for that. It would secure that, and I could leave it like that and not even use Google Authenticator to this gentleman's comment. Um, or I can then go to the next stage, very similar to what I just did with LastPass where I scan in the barcode, which I really like, 
um, and then uh, just take it forward. So that's the quick way to do that. Like I said, for all of the vendors that I mentioned, if you are interested in doing two-factor authentication with them, uh, there's videos out there. There's detailed instructions from the vendor. So <laughs> make sure you're going to the right website. Um, and th they can all help you uh, in, in that respect. And now I'm going to flip back to the other side. And we'll finish the slide deck. Boom. Oops. Okay. And naturally, it went all the way to the end, so. Okay, so we already talked to these guys. And really, just a couple of last comments. Um, this one, I've, you know, if, if you are a business professional, and even if security isn't your job, one of the things you can do as a good IT professional, because security should be part of your job, uh, even if it's just individual practice, um, encourage them to come up with orientation programs, because they're woefully lacking in most companies. Um, you know, I'm not going to read off the list here, but keep, you know, keep your systems patched. It doesn't matter what operating system it is. Um, and also, if you are influenced at all by audits at your company where you work at, or if you're not doing audits, maybe it's something you should consider. It's small businesses, I know that's a lot harder to do, uh, but it's definitely worth con uh, considering. For individuals, um, some of the similar things, we've already talked about kind of scrubbing your online identity, Google yourself. Uh, talked about protecting your identity, and again, um, keep yourself keep your software updated. Um, you know the best practices overall, as I showed you with the identity slide, be aware of the information you're giving providers. Force them to give you statements on how they protect that information. They're legally required to do so. They get fines if they don't. Um, I already talked about password best practices and obviously protecting your information. Key takeaways here, security is a mindset. It's not, gee, something I might get to one of these days. If you're on the internet, you are a target. You may not be in somebody's line of sight yet, but you're a target. If you're a taxpayer in the state of South Carolina, you are already a target. And in, as this gentleman over here showed me, he's already getting phone calls. And they're convincing phone calls. Now, somebody who's a little more astute would recognize it for the attempt that it is. A lot of people don't have that. You know, and the other thing, like I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, don't just be a good practitioner yourself. As you get better at it, talk to your friends. Post interesting links on Facebook. You know, you don't have to get preachy about it, but if there's good practices to do, share them. You know, they'll get ignored by a lot of people. I don't lie, a lot of my friends do. Um, but for those that don't, it might just save them a lot of headache. And if you choose uh, to scan that barcode. First of all, I can assure you it's safe. Um, <laughs> that was the first challenge I got from my uh, sysadmin when he saw it. Uh, it's, it's a very simple link. It's to a uh, one-page handout that just has some tips. Uh, we actually did that as part of our class project. And we, we first wanted to see how many people would actually scan it. Um, most people, in general, QR co codes are novel. We did it just because it's novel. but. Um, Obviously, you can't tell by looking at that where that's going. And you're obviously trusting that I'm sending you to a, a good place. So the question is, how much do you trust me? The answer is, because I'm an active CISSP, if I sent you to a malicious site, I would lose my certification. And that cost me a lot of money. So <laughs> I can guarantee you I won't be doing that. So that's all I have. Thank you very much. Any questions?